This week on The Inside Story, uncertainty in Russia, fear in China. A mutiny by the leader of the Russian paramilitary Wagner Group and the dramatic challenge to the Putin regime. What happened? What are world leaders saying about the Kremlin? And what does this mean for the war in Ukraine? Plus, the VOA mini-doc series From Fear to Freedom. See what life is like for China's Uyghur population. Now, the inside story. Uncertainty in Russia, fear in China. Welcome to the Inside Story. I'm Jessica Dorit in Washington. Today, we're going to focus on the plight of the Uyghur people in China. It's a tale of repression, mass arrest, and family separation. But before that, we're going to try to shed some light on what exactly is happening between Russian President Vladimir Putin and the Wagner Group leader, Yevgeny Prigozhin. It's a tale of two men and three countries, Ukraine, Russia, and Belarus. All that today on the Inside Story. An attempted coup in Russia seems to have fallen flat about a day after it began. The destabilizing and dramatic events followed a mutiny by Russian paramilitary Wagner Group founder Yevgeny Prigozhin against top leaders in Putin's government. Prigozhin publicly blames the Kremlin for mishandling the war in Ukraine, leaving his fighters in heaps. We have daily losses of up to 1,000 people. This includes those killed, those missing and those injured, and those who are refusing, who don't want to fight, not because they are cowards, but because they have no choice, no weapons supplies, no command structure. Putin called the move treason. What we're facing is exactly internal betrayal. Extraordinary ambitions and personal interests led to treason. Treason of their own country and people and of the case that fighters of Wagner were dying for alongside our soldiers. The showdown of Wagner mercenaries advancing on Moscow posed the biggest threat to date of Putin's 23-year reign in Russia. And world leaders took notice. Western governments say the attempted coup shows weakness at the highest levels of the Kremlin with European Union foreign policy chief Joseph Borrell saying this was Putin being bitten by the monster he created. China, meanwhile, remains publicly steadfast in its support of Russia. And while the rebellion was short, fewer than 24 hours from start to finish, big questions remain about Putin's grip on the country. Not to mention what all this means for Ukrainians fighting on the front lines against the Russian military, widely believed to be demoralized. A lot to unpack here. So let's begin with VOA White House correspondent Anita Powell for the reaction from Washington and travel to VOA Moscow Bureau for the scene inside Russia. We'll then join VOA correspondent Heather Murdoch on the front lines in Ukraine. And we'll hear from VOA correspondent Henry Ridgewell, all contributing to this report. Over the weekend, Wagner Group chief Yevgeny Prigozhin halted his fighters' march just 200 kilometers from Moscow and accepted a Kremlin offer for him to go to Belarus. That, in effect, could neutralize him and his mercenaries. What this all means to Washington is another story. On Monday, questions continued to swirl. I think I'd be fibbing to you if I told you that there was some sort of big agenda item uh, changed because of what happened over the weekend. We'll, we'll have to see how this plays out. He said President Joe Biden was briefed hourly on events over the weekend. And on Monday, Biden answered one critical question. We made clear that we were not involved. We had nothing to do with it. This was part of a struggle within the Russian system. In an address Monday, Putin appeared to question that. It was precisely this outcome, fratricide, that Russia's enemies wanted, both the neo-Nazis in Kyiv and their Western patrons and all sorts of national traitors. Analyst Leon Aaron told VOA that one thing is clear. And I think the friendship is probably uh, over. Uh, and uh, the question is what Putin, whether Putin can forgive Prigozhin. Now, the uh, Belarusian leader, uh, Alexander Lukashenko, probably does not sneeze um, before um, checking it with Putin. So whatever guarantees he gave to Prigozhin may not be worth the paper or the phone call. Um, 
they, they were conveyed in. Prigozhin's troops halted their advance just a few hours from Moscow. In an audio statement released Monday, Prigozhin said he sent tanks in Moscow's direction to express our protest, not to oust the government. Anita Powell, VOA News, the White House. Wagner mercenary troops occupied the southern Russian city of Rostov-on-Don on Saturday for about 12 hours, encountering little resistance as they seized the local military headquarters. Russian officials have flooded the media with assurances that Putin emerged stronger from this short crisis. But international observers say on the contrary, the Russian leader's weaknesses have been irreversibly exposed. This destroys the myth that Putin had cultivated so hard of being completely in control and having a firm grip on power throughout the country. That is plainly no longer the case. And the Prigozhin incident sets an extremely dangerous precedent for power in Russia. Once other people see that this can be done and it can be survived, there will be other challenges. Now the Russian authorities are working to cover up the tracks of the Wagner Group, which until last week was praised by Kremlin propaganda. Observers believe that whatever deal Putin has made with Prigozhin, a dark future awaits the mercenary leader. Whatever happens for the rest of his life, he'll be a man looking, after his, looking over his shoulder because he will now be a marked man. He has challenged power in Russia and so far survived. The question is, for how long? Calm has returned, at least for the moment, to the streets in Russia. But after the acute crisis last weekend, Analysts say the events of the last few days may be a precursor to something bigger. For the VOA Moscow Bureau, Jonathan Spear, VOA News. While many Ukrainians anxiously watched the recent chaos in Russia, hoping their foe would defeat or at least weaken itself, soldiers on the front lines battled on. They say there have been no observable changes in the field, and Russian forces continue to lob artillery at Ukrainians who are now on the offensive. When we are on the offensive, conducting an assault, our artillery works first, and most of the Russian soldiers flee their positions. Only a few stay, maybe two or three soldiers, but then we throw a couple of grenades and that is the end. Like many soldiers fighting in Ukraine's weeks-old counteroffensive, he says he has overheard panicked Russian soldiers complaining about lack of ammunition and reinforcements. But soldiers also say the battles have been fierce, as Russian troops have had more than a year to build fortifications and devise strategies to hold this area. If you are monitoring the situation, you know that the offensive and the liberation of cities are not progressing as fast as we would like, but they are progressing quite well. Once a picturesque string of quaint villages, Ukraine's battle here is for what has become an abandoned wasteland. In more peaceful Ukrainian cities and towns, locals say they hope that Russian infighting will speed the end of this war but it's hard to say if that will happen. What's obvious, they add, is that the death and destruction they have already suffered make it impossible for it to ever end all that happily. How many young people died? How many became disabled? The things can be rebuilt, but we cannot bring people's lives back. Besides more than a year of shelling, Zaporizhia has suffered from the destruction of the Kahovka Dam that killed dozens and turned this region's reservoir into a massive desert, leaving locals to try to stave off what is now a looming food and water crisis. But in the combat zone, soldiers say as battles rage on, it's impossible to look beyond what they say is their most immediate goal. We are doing everything to make it end as soon as possible. I would say we're motivated. We want to go home. We understand that we will not go home until our mother Ukraine is free and intact. He says for soldiers, the war will only end if or when Ukraine is victorious, which means for them, retaking all of the land internationally recognized as Ukraine. Heather Murdoch, VOA News, Storozheva, Ukraine. The chaos in Russia is making Warsaw nervous. 
We don't know, and no one in the world knows, what were the real reasons behind the events. European Union foreign policy chief Josep Borrell said the mutiny revealed weakness in the leadership of Russian President Vladimir Putin. The monster that Putin created with the banner, the monster is biting him now. The monster is acting against his creator. The political system is showing the fragilities and the military power is, is cracking. British Foreign Secretary James Cleverly noted that Prigozhin had questioned Putin's justification for the invasion of Ukraine. The Russian government's lies have been exposed by one of President Putin's own henchmen. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg echoed that view. And yet another demonstration of the big strategic mistake uh, that President Putin made uh, with his legal, uh, annexation, uh, or his legal annexation of Crimea and the war against uh, Ukraine. Can Ukraine take advantage of the turmoil in Russia? Certainly this begins to open some doors of opportunity, but we don't go rushing headlong through them. We take them as they are applicable to the plan that uh, Ukraine has already set out. Meanwhile, Moscow's ally China described the attempted mutiny as a Russian internal affair. China supports Russia in maintaining national stability and achieving development and prosperity. European Union member states agreed Monday to boost a special fund used to finance military aid for Ukraine by $3.8 billion, raising its ceiling to over $13 billion. Henry Ridgewell for VOA News, London. We'll continue to monitor the events in Russia, but now we move to China for a tale in three parts about the Uyghurs, an ethnic group living predominantly in Xinjiang, northwest China. In a new documentary, From Fear to Freedom, VOA looks at the struggles of Uyghurs living under Chinese repression. We begin with the story of Kasan Kashgar, a reporter who works for VOA's Mandarin service. For decades, Kashgar lived in fear first as a Uyghur in Xinjiang, where he was repeatedly questioned by police, and later as an exile, acutely aware that speaking out could put family in China at risk. Kashgar fled to the US, where he now has asylum and the courage to speak out. He shares his story with Elizabeth Lee. Fear can be paralyzing. You just lie in your bed, but you can't just get up. Fear also pushed Qasem Kashgar to do something he never thought possible. I didn't want to leave my home country. With Beijing persecuting Uyghurs in Xinjiang and police repeatedly calling him in for questioning, Kashgar fled China in 2017. He ended up in the U.S., eventually landing a job as a journalist at Voice of America. But the Uyghur reporter still feared what the Chinese government would do to his family back home if he wrote under his own name. I've seen dozens of friends, personal mentors, teachers, and some relatives being targeted. They had been interned, imprisoned, killed. Uyghur experts, including Sean Roberts, author of the 2020 book, The War on the Uyghur, say, of the estimated 11 million Uyghurs living mostly in Xinjiang, more than one million have been detained in mass camps. These arrests have been ethnically profiled, mean that all Uyghurs are under constant fear of the potential that they might be detained, arrested. The U.S. and several other countries have accused Beijing of genocide. 
The Chinese embassy in the U.S. declined an interview but directed VOA to comments, stating that the camps were vocational centers and that China's policies were justified in the wake of terror attacks. Some anti-China forces in the United States and the West ignore the fact that the people of Xinjiang are living a better life. They stigmatize and demonize Xinjiang with no bottom line, reason or grounds, and even fabricate the lie of the century of genocide. You have two minutes for your prepared speech. While living in China, Kashgar won several English-speaking competitions this one airing on Chinese state TV. From then on, I worked hard to become... But the publicity caught the attention of authorities. He says police even tried to recruit him to work overseas to spy on Uyghur rights organizations. I was disgusted. I felt dishonored. Instead, Kashgar started a language school. But as China's repression increased, authorities began interrogating him and people he knew started disappearing. Fearing he too could be disappeared, Kashgar fled with his wife and young daughter. At VOA, Kashgar now reports on Xinjiang and China's minorities. At the end, I would feel joy and comfort in doing this because I know that uh, I am making some impact in letting the world know what is happening. Knowing that silence is no guarantee of safety, Kashgar says he is ready to share his stories and those of others by writing under his real name. We just saw the risks for Uyghurs trying to escape Xinjiang, but even those who return to their homeland face danger. Take Miragul Tulson. She returned to her home city in 2015 so her family could meet her months old triplets. But at the airport, officials separated her from her babies and took Tulson away. What came next still haunts the young mother. Here, she recalls the events that forever changed her life. What is this? Why is hot? Miracle Turson is keeping a painful secret from her children, the truth about their sibling, Mohanad. Sometimes you ask, Mom, we have three kids, where is one? When they are grow up, I will let them know. You have actually one brother. They die by the Chinese government kills them. In this book, What Has Happened to Me, Turson has shared her story. A Uyghur from China's northwest Xinjiang region, Turson moved to Egypt for graduate school. There she met and married an Egyptian man and gave birth to triplets. In 2015, during a visit to China so her parents could meet their two-month-old grandchildren, Turson's life turned upside down. At the airport, she says police separated her from her babies, and then they took her away. Tip my mouth, then give my head black hood and then handcuff to take me to from the airport to Urumqi uh, prison. Fergus Shiel has heard similar stories. He managed an international journalism project that analyzed and reported on evidence of mass internment camps, as revealed in Chinese documents leaked to the outside world. One of the quickest ways you can get yourself into a detention camp, this is really quick, if you're on the fast track, is to either have a passport or to be returning from overseas. Several countries, including the U.S., call China's treatment of the Uyghurs genocide. China denies that, saying it is fighting extremists. From 1990 to 2016, there have been thousands of incidents related to violent terrorists, injuring innocents and creating tremendous losses. To target these incidents, the Chinese government has implemented a proper and powerful policy to support Xinjiang. China claims the detention facilities are vocational centers. Turson has a different view. She spent close to three months in detention before the police briefly freed her, saying her children, Moez, Alina, and Mohanad, were sick. She is still haunted by what was waiting for her. Your son, Mohanad, is passed away morning, so we put his body in the full freezer. How my kids die in the morning put in the freezer like ice cream? Shave my hair, give torture. Person says police detained her three times and tortured her with electric shocks. With help from the Egyptian embassy and her husband, 
Turson was finally released from custody, three years after arriving in China. She fled with her two children, first to Egypt and then to the U.S., where she spoke about her ordeal. But doing so prompted Chinese state media, CGTN, to air a report showing this photo more than once, suggesting the photo is of Mahanit. <laughs> but if you listen carefully, Tursun's mother is saying this photo is of Moaz, her grandson, who survived. Tursun says China is forcing her family to discredit her, but she doesn't mind. Near to seven years, I don't have any contact with them. While in detention, Tursun promised God that if she was released, she would speak out and give voice to those still detained. As we saw, China denies and dismisses claims that Uyghurs are abused. But bringing awareness to what is happening in Xinjiang has become the passion of activist Zubaira Shamshedin. Motivated by deadly protests in her hometown and the jailing of her brother, Shamshedin now devotes her career to exposing abuses. We go back to Elizabeth Lee, who has more on this story. Zubaira Shamsuddin can never return to her homeland. If I was in China, I don't think I would be uh, alive. As a Uyghur living in the U.S., Shamsuddin is devoted to fighting against what she and many other organizations worldwide say are injustices against Uyghurs in China, especially in the Xinjiang region. As Chinese outreach coordinator for the group Uyghur Human Rights Project, she tries to educate Mandarin speakers about what is happening there. Uyghurs either detain in the concentration camps or detain in the slave, the slave labor Chinese factories. A 2022 United Nations report found China responsible for serious human rights violations. The U.S. and other Western countries have accused China of actions akin to genocide in Xinjiang. In response to VOA's inquiry, the Chinese embassy in Washington sent links to statements by officials about Beijing's policy in the region. The Uyghur population in Xinjiang has more than doubled in the past four decades. Where did the genocide come from? Forced labor is also nonsense. Workers in Xinjiang choose occupations entirely according to their own wishes. Chinese officials say its policies in Xinjiang have helped suppress terrorism. Shamsuddin says members of her own family have experienced violence under China's Xinjiang policy. In 1997, in the city that Uyghurs call Gulja, a protest calling for equal treatment turned deadly. It's kind of turning point in my life. In 1997, uh, the Gulja massacre happened, which is my hometown. And many of my family members um, became direct victims of that massacre. One of my brother, he's still in prison as a political prisoner because of his connection with Gulja protests. Shamsuddin decided to switch her career from computers to law and international relations, which led her to activist work in the U.S. China sees what happened in 1997 differently, as shown in the state media report that uses the city's Chinese name, Yining. Among some of the worst incidents, the 1997 Yining terror attack, which left seven dead and 198 wounded. Beijing also says Xinjiang is benefiting from its counter-terrorism efforts. This is a land of harmony and stability, where people from various ethnic backgrounds live and work in peace and contentment. There are Uyghurs all around the world that are, uh, can tell you that they are not living a safe, happy and fulfilling life, despite what Beijing says. Shamsuddin says even those who are not in prison are still not free and live under digital and physical surveillance. We all just have any no space to breathe. Because of her work, Shamsuddin says her relatives in China are under surveillance and travel and communications restrictions. But it is her connection to that repression, she says, that compels her to fight for the rights of Uyghurs. Elizabeth Lee, VOA News, Washington. Stay up to date with all the news at voanews.com. You can follow us on Instagram and Facebook at VOA News. Follow me on Twitter at Jessica Dreet, and you can catch up on past episodes at our free streaming service, VOA Plus. For all of those behind the scenes who brought you today's show, I'm Jessica Dreet. We'll see you next week for the inside story.